Well, I wish I could play this old guitar. I've been trying for a long, long time. All them old boys I started out with. Well, they're all playing just fine. But I can grab me a handful of eco and drag it on over to A. But after B, it's beyond me how to take it any other place. Welcome to Guitar Talk, episode two, maybe? maybe two, three. maybe three. We maybe might three. be able to get a couple out of this one. Yeah. I don't know. So, Christmas is coming on, folks, so yeah. we're, we're not gonna we're not going to work during Christmas. We'll skip a week, but uh, maybe we'll have enough out of this taping yeah. to get two weeks' worth. So uh, yeah. anyway, pay attention to those disclaimers. Uh, yes. You know, Very right? important. Yes. Very important. We don't want to get sued and turn have to turn our legal problems over to Webb Wilder <laughs> in our right. legal department. Well, he's got but our so, back. Well, he's got our back, uh, yeah, musically, but, you know, as far as an actual lawsuit, I don't yeah. think Webb's going to really, uh, yeah. I don't think he's passed his bar. <laughs> but, I well, think he's passed quite a few bars. Yeah, he, he has. He's worked in a lot of bars. <laughs> he's not passed very many. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, so uh, that's it, right? We got a lot of stuff for you. We got uh, Kenny Vaughn coming up. We got Kenny Vaughn. Yeah, yeah man. And then our, our next, our next uh, William Steven Seagal on? Have we figured that I out? I think so. We're still talking with his We're management. We're talking with Steven uh, Seagal's management. Yeah. We may have him and George Clooney. Mm-hmm. So. Both. Anyway, uh, it's going to be a good year. Awesome guitar players. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Kenny Vaughn is here with us on Guitar Talk. Um, YouTube, uh, Kenny, and uh, uh, he's everywhere. Uh, yeah. Some of the people you've been playing, you play with uh, Lucinda Williams. Yes, I did. Three uh, years. Three years. And, and uh, uh, who else? Well, when I, when I first came to town, I, I played for the Sweethearts of the Rodeo. That's oh, right. Yeah. And I, I, I came here, um, I'd, I'd lived in uh, uh, New York City for a while, and I went back to Denver, where I'm from. And um, I was playing, I, I, I had a rock band that I was playing in New York City, and we, we had a good time living there, but I, did, I wasn't really happy with the band, so I split and went back to Denver and started playing my old country gigs at, on the country, old-time country circuit, yeah. which I found, which was my... Um, way to make a living from the time I was 18 on because my parents left town when I was about 18. So, um, did they leave you uh, there? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to go to Kansas yeah. and, um, they were, they were in rural Kansas and I was in Denver and I was already playing gigs and had lots of musical connections. And well, Nashville was a logical place for you to, to you to go. Well, I never, you know, I, I, when I, I would, I had never thought about going to Nashville. It never even crossed my mind. I've been to LA, been to, I'd spent a lot of time in Chicago with my band and I lived in New York and, and I was back in Denver and I got a call from Pete Wozner. He's like, hey man, are you available to do some gigs? And I was like, yeah, yeah, what, what is it? And he paid really good. And, and I'd heard the Sweethearts over the rodeo on the radio. And I liked their, their two singles that I'd heard. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I could do that. You know, and he said, well, here's the catch. You got to be here in like two days. <laughs> and I was like, no problem. So I, you know, I threw my amp and my guitars and in the car and um, drove to Nashville thinking that I was going to be gone for like three weeks or a month or something, you know. 
she stayed. Though. You've been here ever since, right? Yeah, I, that was in '87. I ended up playing with those guys for five years. So did when did you just uh, jump into a gig, or did they have rehearsals? Or they had. Um, uh, we rehearsed for two days at SIR, yeah. and then we played Summer Lights, and okay. we played a gig at the Bluebird, and um, it was weird because I met everybody within the first six days I was in Nashville. I mean, I went, I mean, it was crazy. I met, you know, Joe Glazer, who has been working on, on my guitars yeah. for 35 years now, or 33 years, whatever it is. And, um, you know, I met everybody. It was, it was crazy. I saw you, I saw Bob play first, like the first three weeks I was in town, maybe a month I was in town. I saw you at the Bluebird with Joe Nell. Yeah. And I, you know, I was kind of culture shock for me. I never even, I'd never been anywhere near the South. I had no idea what was going on. And I was a little bit, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I didn't fit in really, you know, and I probably didn't make much of an effort to, but uh, I was kind of like thinking, I don't know if this is going to work out for me. You know, this might be too, but then when I heard you play, you hit, you played a Freddie King song and, and you murdered it. And I was like, all right, yeah, there's, there's stuff I like here, you know. And then I saw Tom play with Joe Nell um, not long after that. Were we not both playing at, the, at that time with Joe Nell? I might have been out with somebody or something. Yeah. The, the, two, the, the first two times I saw her, you know, you were playing the first night and the second time it was Tom playing. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, don't, I may have seen you guys together with her later on, but the first two times it was... And then I heard Tom and I was like, oh, well, right. You know, it's like, it's like Ry Cooter's up there playing, you know, it was, yeah. it was great. You know? you know, actually, I think that uh, first gig, uh, that Summer Lights gig, the first time I saw you play, and I said, it was with the Sweethearts, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I had been in, that was like my third day in town. Oh, really? Wow. That was, yeah, we had rehearsed the two days prior and then that was my first gig. And I was, you know, pretty nervous. I was like, whoa. Yeah. You know, there all these people that I recognized from, you know, the country music, you know, from TNN. Yeah. Uh, you know, who, who was the first you know, guy you heard in Nashville that you, or was there anybody that you actually, I, I have to, I wanted to hear Reggie Young. I came, came here in like 74 and I said, man, I got to go hear Reggie Young play. That was kind of, and he kind of, I figured a lot out just by seeing him play. Well, it's funny you should say that because um, a friend of mine, was um, doing guitar tech work for different people. He was kind of a scoundrel. Um, and, uh, but anyway, he called me up one afternoon um, when I was in town. I had only been in town for maybe, you know, a couple of months. And um, he said, hey man, I gotta go over to the studio in Berry Hill and uh, I think you gotta come with me. And um, it turned out that Reggie Young was leading the session. It was a demo session. And Reggie Young was the leader and it was at that studio. I can never remember all the names of the studio, but it's, Good it's luck with still that. there. County it's Q. on that little, it's on the little- uh, County Q. Of, no, it's it's on the little um, uh, short little street there. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not a three street. It's on the, it's on the uh, County Q side of- Okay. Uh, of, oh, uh, of Ransford. uh, uh. Uh, yeah, you know, the, yeah, yeah, it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. But anyway, you could sit on the couch in front of the board and look out into the control room because it had a big window there onto the floor. I should I played a million sessions there. But um, so I sat down on the couch and Reggie Young was right on the other side of the window with his headphones on playing through his deluxe with his strat. And I could see everything he did and he and I could hear him lead the session and and talk to the players and i sat there for three hours it was like going to college man yeah, yeah. i mean i learned more than that three hours than i would have learned in four years of music school yeah know? when i you know i i came down when i came to nashville i had all this gear you know it's like oh i'm gonna blow everybody away but i gotta go hear reggie playing i go hear reggie playing he's using a guitar a chord and a deluxe you know yeah maybe yeah, a distortion deluxe. pedal and, and that was that was it and i thought well shit yeah, well, what have I, I, think been doing? I, I think he had a chorus pedal that he might have been using on like one of the songs. Yeah. And, um, and uh, maybe a compressor. I don't know. It sounded like it. But, um, you know, it was just amazing to watch this guy play and find his little hooks 
and you know and the groove and and the whole thing you know i was you know how it is when you come from a different town you're you're all about hot guitar you know and playing right lots of stuff you uh -huh. know and i was you know uh, you know i was coming from a situation where i, I was you know a lot you know i was playing you know six four or five six sets a night six nights a week right in a country band and i could play a lot of fast stuff or you know whatever but i was playing with older guys that played like uh honky tonk like hank williams right. kind of music and, mm -hmm. and, and they didn't really they were older than me and they were like in their 50s and 60s but they were really good but yeah. so that was kind of cool because i was sort of the young hot shot but but they were more coming from a more uh, traditional honky tonk yeah. attitude, traditional, yeah. you know. So, you know, they were really, really a throwback. But it was a good way for me to play. But anyway, so I was coming from that mindset, and then to watch Reggie play, it was like, oh wow, yeah, this is like, this is yeah. totally different, you know. It was so cool to watch. Him. Yeah, he was the king of finding the right little part for the song. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I didn't know that he played on Drift Away at that time. Yeah. And, you know, and I would, you know, that's one of those things that every guitar player hears and it's like, oh man, there you go. That's cool. Yeah. You know, so you grew up I, in Colorado. Pardon me? You grew up in Colorado. Yeah, I grew up in Colorado. I'm, I was, um, I'm just, I was waiting for you guys calling. I was looking at the Rolling Stones, um, Rolling with the Stones by Bill Wyman to try and figure out what date I saw the Stones, which is all part of why I got a guitar. You know, it was uh, the 29th of November in 1965, which would have been, I would have been 11. And my, I was about ready to turn 12 when I saw those guys, and uh, you know, I I didn't have a guitar yet, you know, and I was like. I'd seen the Beatles and the Stones and the Animals and the Kinks on Ed Sullivan. And, and I was like, man, I got to get a guitar. You know, I kept bugging my dad. And my dad was a jazz buff. And um, before I got a guitar, I was very lucky. My dad was friends with Johnny Smith, the jazz guitar yeah. player who lived in Colorado Springs. And he came up. Didn't he have a music every, store? He night to play this little club called Shaner's. Yeah, he had a music store and um, in Colorado Springs, but he would come up on Saturdays to Shaner's Lounge to play um, a little jazz gig there. So my dad, before I even had a guitar, he said, well, I'm a friend of mine plays guitar. You gotta watch this guy play. So he would take me to Shaner's and set me right in front. You know, I'm like five feet away from Johnny Smith. He says, watch this guy play. He really can play the guitar. You know, and I was like, you know, so I had all those jazz records at the house and I had that, you know, I could, I was, I was listening to Jimmy Smith with Kenny Burrell on guitar. You know, my dad would blast that stuff in the stereo. And and then he had Tony Matola records and Johnny Smith records. And, you know, and he had Miles Davis, So What? You know, and I was like, I thought So What was like the coolest song in the yeah. world when I, you know, when I was, a, I was probably 10 and I was like, what, why is that song captivate me? Why do I keep wanting to hear that song? You know, what is it? Well, that's cool, you know? So I was lucky, you know, and, and so that was the first guy I saw play guitar. And he, um, he took me there several times. And uh, then when I saw the Stones in 65, at the end of 65, you know, I'm watching Brian Jones with his Firebird and Keith with his casino. And I'm like, oh man, you know, the sound of those guitars, you know, and they were still singing through the announcers. Um, uh, right, the PA. You know, the, the speakers yeah. in the ceiling, you know, they did really two mics <laughs> on stage and then, you know, three Fender amps and a drum kit. You know, and that's that was it. And they came on and did like 30 minutes. I don't think they even made it through the lap. They played Satisfaction at the end and and people started going crazy. And, the, and they were in the rounds. The cops had to kind of like just um, form a, right. you know, a kind of a here. circle around him and, and get him off the stage, you know, because girls were kind of trying to jump on the stage and stuff. And the cops were like, all right, you kids. <laughs> Nobody's gonna get hurt. You guys gotta calm down. Kids in your marijuana and your long hair, get out of here. And, and that was the end of the show, you know. And it was like, wow. So had you, did you already have your first guitar at that point? No, I didn't have one yet. And then, um, uh, like soon after that, it was probably right at the beginning of '66. Uh, a friend of mine had a Jaguar, Fender Jaguar, brand new one that his grandma gave him for Christmas. And um, 
he didn't have any interest in playing it whatsoever. And he had a little amplifier and he was kind of a well-to-do kid. He lived about, oh, maybe a half a mile, three quarters of a mile away from me. And he had a little John Deere tractor with a little John Deere tractor trailer, you know? <laughs> and he, and I, you know, I asked him one day, I said, well, if you're not to play the thing, will you let me borrow it, you know? And uh, he said, sure, man. So he came over with this, he drove it over in his tractor, you know, he's got his little lamp. <laughs> and he let me borrow it, you know? And so I started messing around with that thing. And, um, and then my dad had a friend that uh, played in a local rock band, a guy named Dennis Freya, who was a really good guitar player. And he started coming over and giving me lessons. And um, so one thing led to another. And then uh, there was a DJ that lived across the street um, and his boss lived up the street who ran the radio station. And uh, I used to hang out at the DJ's house um, and he had a copy of having a rave up with the Yardbirds mm -hmm. and he let me borrow it, you know, yeah, so Yardbird. there was the Jaguar on the cover and then <clears> there was the other guy playing the, the Telecaster, you know, and I didn't know who their names or anything. Their names weren't on that record, you know, and I was, I, I went nuts about that record. I just, you know, I, I went crazy. I listened to it all the time. And um, so I had a paper route and I started you know, saving up money that summer in the summer of 66. And I was going to buy a Jaguar, but my guitar teacher, um, fortunately, uh, he pointed to Jeff Beck on the record cover. He says, if you want to sound like him, you're never going to get there with a Jaguar, man. You got to get a Telecaster. Yeah. So right. My dad. So I, I took his advice and I went down to Johnny Smith music in Colorado Springs and my dad, um, made a deal and we got a telecaster brand new 66 telly what happened to like it 100. what happened to it? it got stolen but um oh. that's another story for you know later on but uh it um you know i i was just you know fortunate you know it was like 175 bucks for a brand new guitar yeah <laughs> it was oh, great was, you know was it white it was just a standard blonde with a rosewood board yeah but you know it's a good guitar and you know, luckily for me, I ended up with a telly, you know. I kind of think and my the, friend, I think they're the a friend best. of mine. What's that? I was just going to say, I think tellies are the best first guitar. It's always my recommendation to, to a kid that asked me, what should I get? I always say, get a telly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my, my, my teacher was had a 53 telly and he, you know, he showed me how to work it. And, and my friend across the street, um, he had some Buck Owens records and some, his dad had Buck Owens records and Johnny Cash records and uh, uh, Merle Haggard records. And, you know, Buck Owens was kind of big in Colorado at that time. He was pretty popular. And, and um, this was before the Folsom Prison Blues album, you know, yeah. all that stuff. But he had the RCA re-recordings of all Johnny Cash's uh, son stuff where he went back in with his band one afternoon and recorded everything. And I remember there was a, I think it was on that record, but it, there, Folsom Prison Blues, was there was a studio recording of it with Luther playing, do, 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 do. but it had drums on it, you know? And um, it wasn't the Sun record, it was a Columbia recording. And um, I learned how to play that and drove my friend crazy when I got my telly because I could go. <laughs> you know, <he> went, oh. <laughs> do that again, do that again, you know. And um, it was like having that, you know, being able to do that, impress somebody was like, yeah, okay, man. Yeah, I'm going somewhere. Good. What's that? I say I'm going somewhere. I'm yeah, impressed. And somewhere. you still play a telly. I mean, Prim primarily yeah, I, have quite, I have i have a whole bunch of them up there yeah <laughs> do you have any favorites well funny uh the one i've been using the most right now is a fender brad paisley model huh. it's a it's a really good guitar that has a, a pickup that tim shaw made and they it's a, just a standard production guitar i had him uh pull the sticky lacquer off of the neck and then Glazer put a B-bender, a long throw B-bender in it for me. Oh, I didn't and, know you um, used a B-bender. Yeah, man, I like them. They're fun. You know, I'm, I'm trying to come up with stuff 
on them that's not typical, like in other genres. I got an instrumental that I wrote with a beat bender thing, but it's not a country thing at all. And um, Jimmy you know, Olander's so, kind of the master of the beat bender, I think. Oh my God, yeah. he's a he's a damn banjo player, man. He is, man. You know? It's 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 like a it's like his Scruggs tuner, you know, the way he uses it. It's amazing. Yeah, He's I really played with him one, or I sat in with him one night. He said, here, play my guitar. And I, and I didn't know it had a B-bender on it. This thing just kept going off on me. <laughs> and uh, so, man, I got I to gotta leave. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got, I have a couple. I have one with a Parsons White, and I have one with a Glazer. But, uh, Marty's guitar uh, has the original. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. So good. Tell them about Amazing. that guitar. Well, Marty has Clarence White's guitar. It was the the first B bender that uh, apparently the story goes that uh, uh, Gene Parsons, the drummer, and Clarence were doing a session. I think it was a bird session, but I'm not sure. But Clarence had this behind the nut bend that he was doing, and they're writing. The, they were recording the song, and somebody changed the key at the last second, which made it impossible for Clarence to perform his move, but he had Gene come over and he did it as an overdub. And he made Gene press the, the string yeah. in behind the nut yeah. when he made this one move. Wow. And, and he said, man, I wish there was a way I could get my guitar to do that. And Gene says, well, there is, I can do that. And so Gene went to work on coming up with the whole thing. And Marty's guitar is the guitar they used to, to wow. test it. And if you go in and look at the thing, there's G, there there was a G bender hooked up at one time, and you can see how they they just left all the stuff in there. You could rehook it up as a G bender if you right. wanted to right now, and uh, uh, you know it was like the test model. They they really didn't ha you know know what they were doing. But Gene was a um, a motorcycle guy, yeah. So he was he was used to machining stuff, and you know understood you know springs and levers and all the stuff you know from being a motorcycle mechanic and um that's sort of the technology that he uh utilized to come up with that right. thing which is still great i my other one is a parsons white that he put in the guitar it's so smooth and so nice it's just like fantastic you know he perfected it but um uh marty still has that guitar and th those pickups were rewound by the steel player named red Rhodes. yeah uh, in LA, yeah, who was a he was a California he used to rewind guy. pickups for people and you know steel guitar, right? Yeah, he was an LA steel player. Yeah, so who played on the, a lot of sessions? Who and put the um, Parsons White one in your guitar. Gene, Gene did. Gene wow. did. All right. Yeah, yeah. We still see him out in California. He comes out to uh, gigs and he'll sit in with us. And um, he's a banjo player, and he also has an. A Martin with a B bender in it, Martin acoustic that he finger picks on, and that's his main thing. He doesn't play drums anymore, but um, he still works on guitars and still installs B benders. It's really expensive now, but uh, he does great work. It's really good, man. He's he's such a great guy. He's one of those guys that never uh, took drugs or drank or anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he's in really good shape and looks younger than most people his age, yeah. and uh, is is still. Uh, really you know still plays well and he sings well and we back him up and he's a great guy really nice guy speaking of looking younger than your age somebody had written in a question of so ask kenny how is he 167 or 23 <laughs> or something like that <laughs> because he doesn't change i feel like i'm 100 well you still I look like ernie actually, from my three I, sons i am 60 i'll be 60 yeah. Well, I feel like I'm a hundred, you know, I'll tell you what, but uh, no, I, yeah, I don't know what, yeah, I guess that's what, uh, not giving a shit will do for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh low stress. Well, yes. Sometimes. You know, I remember I, I called you uh, last week about this and, uh, wanted you to send some pictures and you sent one, uh, one of the pictures was uh, a view where you look like Ernie, uh, from my three sons. Um, it was a band yeah. shutter. Yeah. And I mean, you really, we'll, we'll, we'll pop it up here anyway, yeah. but you really did. I thought it was Ernie. Yep. That's what I looked like. Uh, that's what I looked like when I got Jim Morrison and Ray Manzarek 
uh, a Coke uh, backstage at the Family Dog in Denver. That, that picture was taken right at that same time. I was uh, my best friend's uh, older sister went out with a guy that did the lights at the Family Dog, so we were over there all the time. Well, I saw Cream there in '68. I wow. saw Helen Wolf. Jeez. You know, with Hubert, someone yeah, I, I saw. You know, yeah, and Evans. Really I mean, I mean, I, I, I. I I, I think the two scariest performers I ever saw in reality were Helen Wolf and Jerry Lee Lewis, as far as yeah. when they'd look up in the audience and just like, they were bigger than life, you know? It's like, and then Hubert over there playing that great, crazy, weird stuff on the guitar. It just, it was and amazing. I, I, I met Hubert at the uh, Eric Clapton Crossroads thing. He has a, these stunningly light blue eyes. You know, yeah, an African American yeah. guy with these just like, I don't know, Swedish eyes or something, and he's just yeah. the nicest guy in the world. And what? Yeah. And I, when I lived, Bob and I lived in Evansville, Indiana, and that was part of the Chitlin circuit. And right, so I, got yeah. to, I got to see a lot of these acts, and so I went to uh, went to see uh, Holland Wolf. And after the show, he was a, at a baseball field. He was just sitting in the stands, you know. So I just started to walk up to him. I was going to maybe try to talk to him, man. And he just gave me that look, and I just turned around. <laughs> Apparently, he was a really nice fellow, according to what everybody I know. That a friend of mine, uh, there was a blues guitar player in Chicago named Little George, who also has one of the most astounding 78 recording uh, record collections in the world. He started collecting records in, in uh, like 1966 or 67 or something. And uh, he has like every test pressing of every chess record. I mean, he just has everything, you know. And all this cool George Barnes stuff from the 40s and anything. But he was at Wolf's funeral. He he knew Wolf. Yeah. And uh, he's a white guy, but he knew Wolf. So it was like, yeah, man, he was a really nice guy. You know? Well, you know the uh, uh, and, Lowell uh, George Wolf story where Lowell George was a little kid. And no, I don't. Yeah, Lowell was his idol as a little kid, and, and Lowell had got a brand new Stratocaster guitar that day, and and uh, uh, Wolf was down at the uh, Troubadour, so he goes down there with his guitar, and he's like he's like twelve years old, and uh, he goes up and asks <laughs> Wolf to sign the guitar for him, and uh, he said, "You're my idol, you know. I listen to you all the time." And he said, "Wolf said, fuck off, kid." <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> oh my God. You don't want to beat your idols. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I was doing a session in, in London uh, back in the 90s, and uh, I, I went down the, uh, the, to the kitchen and I had to pass Studio A. And I, I heard this sound. I was like, oh my God, what is that? It was somebody tuning their guitar up and playing into a very loud amplifier. And I pressed my ear up against the door and I was like, that has to be fucking Jeff Beck. I know that's Jeff Beck. There, nobody else sounds like that. I just stood there and listened for quite a long time, you know? And I just couldn't believe what I was hearing, you know? I was like, and so I went down to the kitchen. I went back to the studio B and the studio manager came in. And I was like, is that Jeff Beck down there? And, and the guy said, yeah, you want to meet him? And I was like, and I was working, you know, and I was like, I was like, no, I'm good, you know, because I didn't know what to say to Jeff Beck. And the, and the engineer turned around, he said, clever lad. He huh. said, you don't want to meet him, trust me. <laughs> 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 and I was like, I'm going to leave it there. You know, I heard him, I heard him through the door and it was like, he's just tuning up and playing these little things, but it was like, Nobody can do that. Well, I know that's got to be yeah, I've, that one guy. I've done the, uh, all those clapping deals with him, and he's a great guy. You know? Jeff is, he's a really nice, sweet guy. You know? But I would hear him in his dressing room, like you said, he, he'd be practicing, and you, you walk by and you go, that's Jeff Beck. Yeah. No, it's instantly recognizable. Yeah. yeah. Nobody plays like Jeff. No. Yeah. I think that's what. Uh, Musicians should strive for if you can be simplicity, well, melody, that and and if you can be recognizable, you know, and different. Oh man, than everybody else. And I actually know people. Uh, some, and I'm not going to mention their names. They're pretty respected guitar players who don't get him. 
Do you know anybody? Really? Yeah, yeah, I do. And there are a couple people you know, and I'm not going to bring their names up here. That's crazy, man. I know. How could you, like, you know, that, you know, it was like that, he was the reason that I was so obsessive about playing guitar, really. You know, he was the guy that really, you know, it was like like that record, having a rave up and then over under sideways. Well, you know, Jeff Beck also supposedly co-wrote Living for the City with Stevie Wonder. Uh, that whole rip, bump, 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 was a Jeff Beck rip because he was recording in Detroit at the time in another studio, and and uh, Stevie heard it, yeah. said, "Man, I got to do something with that," and and uh, just said, "Take it." Man. So what? That's that whole riff from that. Yeah, I've heard that. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff's amazing, man. Yeah. So who? Uh, what about new players in, around town? Any new players around town? Guitar players you've been listening Jim to? Jim Oblon. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, well, he's well, I think he's back now. Did he come back? Uh, yeah, he I talk to him every now and then. I think he's back in town. I, I got him. To, he's going to be on the show. He's unique. You know, you can hear you can hear him a mile away. You know, if I hear him play like just a couple of measures, I'd like that's Jim Oblon. Yeah. Know? Yeah. He's, he's, I, he's, I played with him several things. times. We did a, a few a couple of uh, Jim and Tom shows together. Mm -hmm. You can get him on YouTube. That's so cool, man. He's he's a blast, man. But yeah, I think I, he's been kind of going back and forth between here and LA. And yeah, yeah. Well, I love that thing so he good, does. Man. I love that thing he does where it's when he's comping, then and he plays the fifth on the bottom. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. Like, he uses <laughs> he. And that's what you know. That's what I told him. I said, man, you, you finally I get to see somebody that uses the fifth and sixth string. Yeah. More yeah, well, you know, that's else. a steel guitar. That's a steel guitar move. Sure, that's, and that's why I used it because I used to play steel. So I'm always used to having yeah. like a third on the bottom or a five on the bottom and a third on top in these in this low. Yeah, yeah. The bottom, the bottom thing is cool. The way Jim does it, he puts five on the bottom. Yeah, and the three on top. He's got the the roots on top and then five. Yeah, it's so cool, man. Yeah, he it's bounces amazing. that. He'll go like a. a yeah. I'll do it. A, uh, you know, it's a, you're right, right. You know, right. You know, instead. Yeah, that's yeah, it. When he plays it when he plays that kind yeah. of thing, and then he does a lot of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people don't do that, you know. And and, and when he does it, it's perfect for a telly, you know, because you can hear the low end on a telly. You know, it doesn't get money yeah. like a Les Paul or something. Yeah, he plucks it down there. You know, you can pluck it and get that really good raspy tone and get it to really speak. And so it's very much like the, some of the steel players I played with in the '70s when I was playing country gigs, and you know, they were kind of old school steel players. And when they, anytime they you play like a a rock tune or something, they would use that move to right. comp, you know. Yeah. Right. You know, it would be like a, a steel guitar kind of thing, the way to play rock. I played with this one guy that was really good at that. He still had a, a fender double neck and, you know, really a 50s kind of steel player, you know. Right. He could play really good country stuff, but Did then he could turn around and, and imitate. Yeah, he had he had those cables. Um, oh, cables. His, old uh, fender, uh, old fender, fender steel. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was a 400. And, and he was one of those guys that um, his he would like uh, he would always get up and go turn his adjust his reverb on his amp like for a ballad he'd turn the reverb up and then for a country swing tune he'd right. go back there and turn it off <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he'd get up in the middle of a song and adjust right. it you know <laughs> and uh, he was really great man but he was he was really good at doing that kind of stuff and I actually made him show me some of that stuff. He's like, oh, that's simple. It's just two notes, man, or three notes, you know, mm -hmm. at the most. But uh, but it's way also it yeah, it's also so you're cool. coming out of a 15 inch pedal steel amp speaker too, you know, so it's pretty yeah. aggressive. Yeah, yeah. He played. He actually played through a twin with a yeah. with a D130 that he got in there. Yeah, all the steel players are using the little Walters now, I guess. Uh, well, yeah, I guess some of them are. Yeah, Paul Frank. I think Lloyd, yeah. Lloyd Green's still playing through his old um, twin head and uh, D130. You know, he's still, oh, is that what he's doing? Still using, yeah, still has it. That's more rig. plays through a deluxe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So does uh, Russ Paul play through a deluxe? And, uh, yeah, he play. I've seen Russ play through a Princeton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And make, and he sounds great. You know. Doug Moore yeah, had a him. Doug Moore actually had a question for you, and uh, it was. Uh, did your guitar tone change when your hair grew long? 
This is Doug. <laughs> this is not us. Well, it probably did, but it was a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and somebody else asked, um, was there a time when Marty Stewart and you guys were using like massive amounts of twin reverb amps? Well, yeah. When I first joined Marty, he was using, uh, he had been using four. Four and he, twins? And he, yeah, and he had those silver faced loud ones with the master volumes, you know? Yeah. And he had a, he had about 10 of those things in his warehouse. And, and he would, he'd stack two on each side. He'd stack two on one side of the drums and two on the other side of the drums, you know? But when I joined, he cut it down to two twins. And, and I was on him for years. I was like, dude, I said, man, you, those things are working against you, man. You're, you're not getting what you want. I know it. Yeah. And um, we finally, um, everything really changed when we started doing the Marty Stewart TV show. Uh -huh. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we had yes. to play really, we had to play super quiet, you know, because we had all these old country singers, you know, like you can't play loud behind, right. you know. Lynn Anderson or Connie Smith right. or Stonewall Jackson or Charlie Pride. You got to play quiet, man. Mm -hmm. You know, those people are not used to loud, the, you know, and the drum, you know, Harry had to play really quiet, right. just like barely hitting his drums. But when you hear it on the TV, it sounds big because, I know. you know, as you guys know, the quieter you play, the bigger it sounds, you know, it's weird, man, but that's just the way it is. And so I was using my Princeton and he got a Princeton and he started using that and he was like oh man he said this is great you know this is like a whole new world for me you know and i was like yeah man you know and we started you know sh you know in working with like preamps to boost the signal a little bit to get it you know goose up the front end of the amp a little bit you know mm -hmm. like you know, i use i always used to use my old mxr micro amp to, yeah. If you if I was playing a telly, just to hit the front end a little bit harder sometimes, just to get a little bit of, you know, a little bit of warmth around the uh, the note sometimes it helps, you know. Yeah, that, like and would, that's drop, something but. that you know playing soft that some people takes a, it just takes a lot of time for you to figure that out. I think you know a lot of young players don't necessarily get that and, until. You do it, and it, it's also you know even drums. You know, you said Harry had to play really soft. Oh man! You know, Greg Morrow, oh, when he favorite. plays. He's he he hits the drums really lightly, well, but well, they so sound. Is, so does Jim Keltner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keltner plays. He never played. I I've seen Keltner play quite a few times, and mm -hmm. and I noticed that for the first time. The guy has such a nice touch. I got to see the the Mad Dogs and Englishman tour with Jim Gordon and Jim Keltner on drums. You know. Damn. Yeah. And I marveled at their sound, you know, it was like the best two drummer gig I ever saw. Yeah. Yeah. Really, they were really powerful, but it was, it was the fact that they were just playing so well. It wasn't the fact that they were hitting hard at all, but it sounded like a train, you know, when they, you know, that band was so cool, man. You know, all those backup singers and mm -hmm. the horn players, and, you know, it was just like Co Radel playing bass. Yeah. Jim Gordon and Jim Keltner on drums. I mean, you couldn't go wrong. Yeah, yeah. It was like, I was so fortunate to have been able to see one of those shows. You know, I was like, it Bob, blew me away. Bob, Bob and I worked with Keltner on a record. And, uh, oh, man. And he, <laughs> uh, he, uh, he played Larry London's black kit. He flew into town and Sean London set uh, let his dad's kit up for, mm -hmm. uh, for Jim and uh, Jim, uh, it's hard to do. It's kind of hard to do a session with him because he, his hands are down here. You know, when you're in a studio and the drummer's, ah, da, he's kind of controlling the whole thing. You can see his hands. You never see Jim's hands up here that much. They're always down there. So you to get your cue. So you just you got to get cl kind of close to him. And that's when I realized how soft he plays. Yeah. Yeah, man. I got to see him play a couple of times when he, where he was the only drummer. I got to see him in Ry Cooter's band back in the '80s. Yeah. And then I got. To him uh with little village mm -hmm. um in the early yeah 90s. i saw that we, we were probably at the that that same show yeah 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 the t-pack yeah. i think it was yeah 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 <laughs> well he played he played on uh time out of mine the dylan record that i did and uh I sat, oh man i sat that right next a, to him so uh, that's a great record too man yeah that's one of the greatest dylan records of all time he's uh 
he's a pretty uh, amazing guy, you know. Did you oh, yeah. get your handshake? And he's all, well, yeah, and he's all, he's always twiddling with something constantly, you know. He's you know, if he's if we're not playing, yeah, he's right. messing with oh, yeah. drums all the yeah. time, man. Yeah, he's like uh, he's like Kenny Malone. Yeah. He's he's like he's never satisfied with the way the drums are tuned. He's, yeah. he's tuning to the last last song of the session. He's still tuning things. Yeah. Man. Yeah. He, he, I picked up one of the greatest showbiz moves ever from him backstage um, in the eighties. We were talking to him and somebody, I don't remember the artist he'd been, he had just put out, he'd been, he played on a big record that was really famous. I can't remember the, it was a female singer, but I don't remember her name. Uh, and it wasn't a Nashville person. But anyway, somebody said, oh man, you know, you guys are getting a lot of airplay with that record, man. You know, you get it out. how was she to work with? And he goes, she was, she was great. <laughs> <laughs> and he changed the subject. <laughs> and I was like, that's the coolest showbiz move I've ever seen in my life. You know, that's, that's it, that's yeah. it, there you go, you know. The best one I got was from uh, Al Anderson. Uh, oh, yeah. NRBQ. When I first met Al, it was in the middle of the desert in uh, New Mexico. He uh, lives out there, and I was working with Patty Loveless, and he came out. And I didn't real, I didn't know that Al was you know, kind of deaf, you know. Yeah, right. You got to yeah, like yeah. yell at him. So I'm standing there. Yeah. I introduced myself to Al, and I said, uh, "Al, man, you, you know." I asked him a question, and he just kind of looked away, and he said, "Man, this is really good nose picking weather, isn't it?" <laughs> that was it i know exactly what he means yeah. here, <laughs> well there's the story I gotta, uh, I... there's a great story of he, he, he and vince were writing together one day oh yeah vince, <laughs> vince tells me this he says so i'm sitting here and uh or maybe yeah it was vince and uh, it was vince. they're writing a song and yeah. and vince has a line and he says uh hey well what about what about this and he gives gives the line to al and he said al just sits there and goes nothing you know not a word and vince is vince is thinking to himself oh man that's the best line i, thought, I, I, ever thought, came I, thought, I thought that was great and well geez what's it take for this guy and, <laughs> and and he says then al goes what'd you say <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he man, tells I, him the line and then i was like oh that's great <laughs> I've got a good guitar talk story with Al Anderson. I was, uh, this is a good guitar story. I was doing a, uh, a Kim Ritchie recording session over at uh, that place called uh, Hum Depot. Remember that place over in Berry yeah. Hill? Yeah. Over by the Sutler there. So um, we were upstairs in the, in the main studio on the main floor upstairs. And um, I was set up in the control room and they had my deluxe reverb like in a closet somewhere quite a ways away on a long cable and, and it, you had to walk through like three different doors to get to it so i had it set up you know and uh richard richard bennett was producing and it was a kim ritchie session and and so the songs were really good you know and, and it's it cool and i was playing my old uh, uh guild guitar it's a it's a 61 x175 arch top with two, those two white fronds single coil pickups that look like p90s but they sound more like the armaments or something you know it has a bigsby on it you know so you know i'm playing that guitar and um al was the co-writer on one of the tunes and he was there and so it's a, it's like about 11 it's about it's actually it's about 12 12 30 you know we're, we're we're doing the morning session and about time to break for lunch and i'm doing an overdub on this solo and I'm coming up dry, man. I'm like, I'm trying some stuff. And I was like, you know what? I said, Richard, you're the king of this stuff, man. This simple sort of low kind of thing, you know? And I said, here, you do this. Come on, man. You've been listening to the songs as long as I have. Just sit, sit here and play my guitar. And Richard, oh, no, I don't want to. I said, come on, man. He's, so he sits down on my guitar after I'd taken quite a few passes. And, you know, I had a thing, but I wasn't happy with it. I said, you do it, man. He said, so, and Al's there, you know, and, and Al's like, yeah, that sounds good. And Richard's like, oh, that's terrible, man. He said, Al, come here. You wrote this damn thing. You play it. So Al sits down and he plays it, you know, and it was like really good, you know, and it was like, okay. 
good. And so we broke, went to lunch. And we came back and the engineer called me and he says, says, you're not gonna believe this. He cues up the, the, the solo section and he fades my guitar in and he fades Richard in and then he fades Al in, in different sections. He said, it sounds like three different guitars, man. He said, I sat here and watched. Nobody ever touched the controls on that guitar the, the entire time. I didn't touch anything on the board. It's the same mic, the same amp, the same guitar, same solo, same song. Everything's, nothing's been changed, but he said, it sounds like three different instruments. Yeah. You know? And I was like, you know, damn right, That's it does. Perfect. And it really did. It's, it was like, wow. You. It's all, yeah. it's all right here. I was like, you know, yeah, it was like proof positive that the tone is in your fingers and in your touch. It's not, you know, it's 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 not so much about gear. You know, I always get people calling me and messaging me on, um, you know, social media. Me, hey, man, I, what? How can I get this sound? How can I get the sound to sound like you on that song? And what? Blah blah blah. You know, with that, that tone you get on this. You know, you know how that is. And I'm always like, well. You could try this, you could try that, but really, it doesn't. It's not going to help that much. No, no. You know, you just, no. it's more about the way you um. The more you know, it's the way you play. It's not so much about gear, you know. I mean, gear helps, but you know, not not as much as you would. Yeah, we have a one play. of our questions that we got from a guy was he keeps. He's not getting any better. He keeps practicing. So he keeps buying more and more expensive guitars because he thinks that's going to solve this problem. Uh, so we're going to address that. And you kind of just did address that in a certain way. Uh, the only thing I can figure from the guys is if he keeps buying all these guitars, he's probably not married, first of all. And, yeah. uh, and, he's, and he's very lonely. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not the guitar. It, no, really. it's not. I mean, I, if you know, if I I've had gigs where my instruments didn't arrive, you know, and and I had to use, uh, you know, a, something from some other band member backstage, whatever, you know, or, you know, and it, I always freak out, thinking, oh man, this is gonna suck. But then you know, you go up there, and, and the band's like, well, you didn't sound any different to me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know still I still sound like you. I think that's a thing, you know. It, Everybody, I think, has a sound in their head, in their heart, in their soul that they're that they gravitate toward. And you know, yeah. even if, even picking up different guitars, I mean, they're all they'll, they'll sound different, but there's a basic core tone I think that everybody has. You know, yeah, yeah. They, they, there can be very variances of, of that tone. It, it in 1969, my guitar was a a 68 Les Paul a, a standard with two P90s that I had scored, and that was my main guitar. And I had a Fender Twin that I played it through at that time, and I scored a um, a 59 Strat with a maple board for like 175 bucks, and so I started playing that and the Les Paul, and our bass player, who was a really good musician, was like. He's like, I can't believe you spent all that money on that Stratocaster. He said, you don't sound a bit different on that thing than you do on your Les Paul. <laughs> and I was like, to me, it sounded completely different. You know, I was like, what are you talking about, man? But, you know, he's on the other side of the stage. And he's like, man, he's, I can't tell the difference, you know. And, <laughs> and he was a good player. You know, he was like, this guy was no dummy, you know. And I had to take what he said sort of. You know, like I had to kind of consider what he was. I was like, "That's not stupid." You know, and, you know it made me th wonder, but it didn't stop me from wanting to, you know, try every guitar in the world. Still, you know. Do you remember a guy named uh, Larry Cheney who lived here? Oh, I oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Larry had this whole rack. You know, Larry was into effects, and he had this whole rack of all this gear. Oh, I remember it. And, and, and yeah, I went up, to, you know, I was doing a gig with him. I said, man, what is this thing doing? He goes, this does that. You know, what is this doing? He goes, well, that does that. And I said, well, this one's not even turned on. What is this doing? He goes, well, that's the piece of gear that I bought that finally got me my divorce. <laughs> so I just keep it in there for, for <laughs> memory. Sake. I used to go see him with uh, Gail Davies. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild Choir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wild Choir. Wild Choir. 
they were they were a really good band you know they were like they had really good vocals and they were well rehearsed and tight and larry was he blew up my mind man yeah. he was so good it's really great i see him he lives in austin now yeah and so uh whenever i go to austin i always call him up and usually we'll get together and have lunch or he'll come to oh man come he's to the a show. great guy yeah. he is man he's great, great player great, great, guy, great yeah. musical head oh, but he used to play through this little box lightning 15 right. watt amp or single 10 i think he used but uh another you know little amp guy which is yeah little amps are where it's at man i, I got a 38 ES1 or no, it's EH150 Gibson, hmm. the yeah. little Charlie Christian thing with a single yeah. 12, you know? I've got two of those. That's a great amp, man. Oh my God. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like a Marshall or something when you crank it up. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's so cool, man. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it has all the good sounds and none of the bad ones. It's just like instant good tone. Yeah. So I have a, a, a question about, uh, I saw here where it says in 2002, you were inducted into the country music hall of uh, the Colorado Country Music Hall of Fame. True or false? That is true. Yeah. So there is. I wasn't there. Uh, my parents actually went to the ceremony. Uh, I knew a lot of the people that that were there, and um, I, I was on tour, and I couldn't, you know, get away to uh, right. go to it, unfortunately. But my parents. Uh, went and accepted the award oh, on my please. behalf. And they, they got a big kick out of it. I, they, they probably enjoyed it more than I would have. Yeah. Do they have <laughs> you know a, is there a statue of you there? Or no. how do they, what do they do? No, it's, it's, I don't think there's a location for it or anything. Uh, it's okay. just a, a thing yeah. that exists, yeah. uh, you know, in somebody's mind, uh, you know, they, I don't think it's that big of a deal, but you know, uh, I was, I was glad to get the award, you know. Somebody, somebody nice contacted to... me about the Iowa equivalent of that. Yeah, I don't think they're. See, we're from Iowa. Yeah. We're really hoping that we're going to end up in the <laughs> Iowa Country Music Hall of Fame or Blues <laughs> Hall of Fame. Can you imagine that? What part of Iowa? What What part of Iowa were you guys from? Well, we uh, uh, kind of all over, but mainly we kind of started playing when we lived in Sioux City, Iowa, yeah. and we we kind of okay. grew up. Cool. Uh, you remember Tommy Bolin? Of course. He was a friend of mine. Well, wow. he, yeah. he, well, I went to school with Johnny. Johnny was in my grade. He's younger brother and from Sioux City. And Tommy uh, uh, was from Sioux City. And mm -hmm. So that's kind of what got me going on the guitar was, was Tommy Bowen. Well, wow, he's so good. At 69, my little neighborhood band that I'd had since uh, we started playing in like January of 67. And by 69, we were a pretty good band. And we got tapped to play all these hippie kind of festival things right. uh, that were happening in Colorado at that time. And also some, uh, we were also on some uh, uh, like student protest things, you know, they would hire us to go play. And we weren't into the protester thing or anything, right. but we liked the audience, you know, we were like, yeah, because we were writing a lot, of, a lot of our own songs and, you know, we were pretty ambitious and, and we opened for Zephyr, which was yeah, Tommy's yeah, first band yeah. there in Boulder, a lot. And I'd seen them play a lot prior to us opening for him. But he was always really nice to me. And uh, we we uh, palled around, you know, at gigs. You know, he we'd sit and play guitars and talk. And wow. he was such a sweet guy. Really nice, easy guy to hang out with, you know. He was doomed and, from the get-go, man, you know. There was, a, <laughs> there was one show we played up in Fort Collins in a field. And uh, it was one of those all day hippie fests in a field somewhere. But uh, some guy came to the backstage with some real, rather powerful enhancement thing. And yeah. Tommy and my other guitar player and I all took some. And uh, <laughs> fortunately, we were used to that sort of thing and we were able to handle it right. and we played, we played the gig. But I remember Tommy was a. Uh, <laughs> He was especially entertaining that evening. <laughs> he was really, he, he, he really got going with the Echo Flex and everything. So was he playing he, through Marshall, like half stack or? No, he was using, he was using two twins. Oh, wow. Was he playing his Les Paul or his Stratocaster? He was playing his Les Paul with the wraparound tailpiece. Yeah, you know who owns that? Joe Bonamassa. Really? Yeah, Joe found that guitar. Huh. And you I played that guitar. Yeah. Yeah. 
Joe bought it. I don't yeah. know what he paid for it, but uh, he he has it. He's trying to find his. I think Johnny, his brother, may have his Stratocaster. I'm not sure. The white one. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, man, that was a good guitar. He he had a band right after that um, called Energy in in Colorado. Uh, Energy was a pretty cool little band, and the, he, he switched the Strat on that for that gig. Yeah. And uh, that's when I first saw him play through a Marshall was in in, in, in Energy, but. Uh, Ben Zephyr, he was had these two twins that he used, and they I don't know why they sounded so good, because I, do. I think he used the Sam Ash fuzz tone. Yeah, he had he had a Sam Ash yeah well <laughs> he had a Sam Ash fuzz tone and he had his Echoplex and I think that was the secret. But you know those those two twins they were silver twins and and one night Zephyr opened for John Mayall and Mick Taylor played through those two twins uh-huh. and mick taylor sounded just like he was playing through marshalls it was it was crazy he had his les paul and he was just sounded like a million bucks you know and then i saw him play i saw mick again like six months later uh, on the first night he played in the states with the rolling stones and fort, fort collins mm-hmm. and uh that was pretty cool it was 1969 yeah i saw like, the, um, that's the version of the stones i saw was the mick taylor version yeah, well, this this is the first night and uh, of the tour, and uh, I didn't know that at the time. But but what what really stood out for me that night was BB King, was the Terry Reed opened the show and then BB King came on, and this is the pre Thrill Is Gone BB yeah. King. This was like the more live at the Regal BB yeah. BB King, you know, and he had that horn band, and they blew the roof off that place, man. I mean, and BB was playing his ass off i mean he was fierce you know and i thought man these rolling stones guys got a little balls <laughs> but then they came out and it's like within the first 30 seconds everything was wiped out it was like i couldn't believe it yeah you know, when i saw when him stevie wonder opened up for him so yeah man, I mean, it was the same what... deal goes man i hope these guys are good because that guy's really good <laughs> You know, the first time I saw him in 66, Patti LaBelle was on before they were, you know, Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells. And, you know, they didn't have any problem. (laughs) You know, something about the Rolling Stones, all bets were off once they hit the stage. You know, it's like they don't operate on anybody else's level, you know, so they get a pass. Hey, uh, what about uh, strings? You like you you play flat wounds a lot, don't you? I I've, I've always had guitars with flat wound strings on them um, around, but not for my like not for a Marty Stewart gig. I don't. Okay, you know? I mean, so you those use just a regular break, telly. Yeah, tens. Yeah. Okay. But I do have uh, two tell. I have two tellies with flat wounds on them, and you know that's the Luther Perkins things. Right. You know that, that's how we played with heavy flat wounds. Yeah. And I have one telly that has a a Bigsby that has flat wounds and another telly that just regular with flat wounds. And, and I've tried them on strats before and on my Jaguar and my jazz master, those are flat wounds too. Mm-hmm. But you know, Jaguars and jazz masters were shipped originally with flat wounds and all the surf guys used heavy gauge flat wound strings. So if you really want to get the surf tone, yeah. you got to have like 12s with a wound third and that's that's the sound, man. Yeah. You know, that's that's the tone. And those guitars sound really good. Have you ever seen the footage of Joe Pass playing the Jaguar? Wow. Or no, the Jazzmaster? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Really? There's footage of him in like the sixties uh playing a gig, a jazz gig, and he's playing through like a fender bass a black face bassman and um playing a jazz master and just sounds like a Gibson to me, yeah. you know. Sounds like one seventy five when he's playing it. But, uh, you know, they're really good guitars, those, those Fenders. You know, they're really versatile. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing what you can do with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, but you, you can get a lot of, like, that old 56 strat of mine. Put it on the front pickup and roll the tone back. Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. It's amazing the sound, different sounds you can get out of them. Yeah. For, for many years, my only guitar was I had a 66 strat. And for like quite a few years, that's the only guitar I had. So, and I was working all the time playing gigs and some sessions. And I, I never came up short for 
you know, whatever tone I needed to have on that thing, you know, I just, you know, the only thing that has, that has always bothered me about Strat is the, uh, the bridge position, the bridge pickup has always been a little clanky sounding on that, uh, particular body style. I, well, I like you know, it. but then you hear, you hear Jimi Hendrix and Johnny Guitar Watson and Jimmy Blast through that pickup. They sound great. Oh, no, I, yeah, Jimmy Vaughn. Yeah. I remember one time I saw Jimmy Vaughn play a gig and he never switched it out of the bridge pickup all night long. Right. Mm -hmm. The whole, so, the yeah. whole set. I was, I was right in the front and I watched him and and then, like the last time I saw him, he never switched off the neck pickup. Mm -hmm. But you know, I you know, and he uses heavy gauge spot mounts, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, on his strap. You know, I asked him about that. I said, "Those are pretty heavy." He said, "Oh man, that." So I like that. Get that saxophone sound, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> okay. Whatever you know, but. But man, yeah, that gig it was at 328 back in the 328 now. performance hall. And uh, man, he put play, he played he had a matchless amp and he played it on the bridge pickup all night long. He didn't have sounded a, great. Uh, he didn't have a bass player that night. He had the Remember? keyboards. Yeah, Keyboard. he had right. Yeah. He had the he, he was kicking, yeah. kicking pedals. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah and 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 uh, had the two black guys singing. Uh huh. God. It was really good, man. It's a great night. It was a good. Yeah. He was on that night. Yeah, I've gotten to work with him uh, a few times. I had we had him play guitar on uh, uh, the Delbert record before this last one. Had him put guitar on one of the tunes. So went down. So good. Went down to Austin and recorded him there, and uh, uh, it was great. Uh, last time I saw him, he was playing with a pick again. And for a long, long time, long time, he didn't play with a pick. I know, he, he quit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like Jeff back to using doesn't, doesn't use a pick. And he occasionally does. He will occasionally pick on up to do a certain line and then he'll mm -hmm. put it right back down. But mostly he's just the same thing I do. Just I don't use picks. I just use skin yeah. and a little bit of nail. The story I heard yeah. was that, uh, you know, way back early on, he walked up he was at doing the live show somewhere and he dropped his pick and mm -hmm. he just said well, never again well you know yeah i mean and that's really part of his style though too his style is based on limitation mm -hmm. and so he eliminated the pick and realized man i gotta be a little simpler here i can't do all this and this and this mm -hmm. so i'm just gonna rely on tone and simple metal uh, uh melody and i think that's that's why he is who he is yeah. you know well, I think I think you can get a more vocal sound oh, out yes. of the guitar when you yes. use your finger. Yeah. You know, you can you can you can coax different shades yeah. out of the strings easier with your fingers than you can yeah. with the pick. You know, like a lot of times if I'm doing something in the studio where I gotta play something that really speaks, I'll just play with my finger. You know, because it'll it sounds better. It sometimes. also gives you a, a different groove. A totally oh, different way better, feel. I think, yeah, way better, yeah. And especially on ballads. You know, if you go to yeah. twist your fingers and you do a soft little solo, yeah. Yeah. it just feels better. You yeah. know, if you if well, you know, I saw that what, that night I saw Helen Wolf. It was in 1968, and Hubert played with no pick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was really close to him, and I was like, man, that guy's not using a pick. I can't believe yeah. it. You know, yeah. I find I, 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 heard I, find I use a pick less and less these days. You know, more more fingers because it's just it's more fun to play with that one in some ways you know yeah my our uh, gear, you know, our, uh, the older we get we get less gear we use less picks i think by the time we're 90 we'll be using no gear at all <laughs> man I, I, this guy sent me a uh a standell solid yeah, state and, oh yeah you know uh, billy bird used to play through uh one of those <laughs> Yeah, and and I'm like that's and the one the one he sent me is the single fifteen standout. Did it have the colored and knobs on it or the uh, push no, button? No, it 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 just has a it's two channels and one channel has a tremolo. There's no reverb or anything, mm -hmm. and it's very simple. But man, it, that's the same model that West Montgomery played through, and I'm like, well, I know where I'm going. I'm going to keep this one. Uh -huh. <laughs> this it, it sounds so good for that. That kind of sound, you know. Yeah. And uh, Billy, uh, what, what's his name? McGrady Martin, apparently. Yep. 
uh, favored a standell yeah. for a while. And I there. think that's why Billy Bird used the standell. I did a session with Billy Bird when he was a cab driver in Nashville. Yeah. He, uh, uh, Leon that. Russell got him to come in and do some, uh, some of the old uh, Ernest Tubb. We were doing some Ernest Tubb songs, and actually I sat there with Billy Bird while he played, and he had that old standell wow. amp, and it had all the lights were like different colors and everything. It was just cool shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. That's cool. I love Billy Bird. I hear he was a jazz guitar player. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. You've got a lot of that from your early days. Well, you know, I, you know, I was, um, I was really lucky. Um, in like '72, I think, uh, my, I went to my local music store and um, uh, to buy some strings or something. There was this guy over in the corner playing guitar, and I was like. I went over there and watched him play. I was like, whoa. And, and I went back to the counter and I asked the guy who had, owned the store, I said, Gordon, who the hell is that, man? He said, oh, that's my new guitar instructor, Bill Frizzell. <laughs> I said, sign me up. I want to study with this guy. Yeah. And so I st started studying with Bill and that was the best thing I ever did. He's great. I had taken lessons from different people, but like Bill had an approach that where I learned a lot Simplicity. about how to, well, he showed me how to apply, you know, he showed me what music theory was and how to apply it to the fingerboard and how to, you know, eliminate certain notes. Mm -hmm. He said, just play the important ones. Right. Don't play the ones that you don't need, you know, three, and three notes. He, yeah. And he, he explained all that stuff to me and it, and it was like, pretty concise he was really a space cadet you know he was probably about five or six years older than me at the most but he didn't know what he was doing with his life at that time he was like you know I was like well what are you gonna do I man what do you want to do you know he said well man I don't know I don't want to play just regular jazz standards you know I don't want to play in a rock band I don't want to you know he had a 175 with one pickup on it at the time and he had been studying with Jim Hall and then he left, came back to Denver where he grew up and he was given lessons and living in some crummy apartment and he was going nowhere fast, you know, and um, he was pretty spaced out. And one day uh, after about two months, I learned a lot in two months, but uh, after two months, I went in there and he said, man, I'm sorry, but this is going to be our last lesson. I said, oh, yeah, what's going on, man? He says, I'm. I got to go to New York. I got to get out of here. <laughs> I said, well, good luck, you know. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, a couple of years later, he's, uh, he's built for playing on everything. He, you know, played on all these great jazz records and well, all the great jazz players. And I reconnected with him in the 90s and we're still friends. And mm -hmm. He's doing really well now. He's got, he's been doing a lot. There's a lot of YouTube stuff that you can uh, get Bill Frizzell on now. It's, it's all yeah, really it's great. Good, man. He's a really great player. He, yeah, you know, he has his own thing, but I, I was really fortunate to run into him because it kind of, you know, I, I had all that jazz influence from listening to jazz, you know, as a kid. And and I played, I had a jazz band that I played in in the early 70s that played sort of progressive jazz for that time. This is sort of right before the fusion era, but we were sort of like playing you know, Joe's Arnold tunes and Carl Bla Carla Blay tunes yep. and stuff like that. So I was able to apply Bill's lessons to all that stuff because I was the only guy in the band that played chords. We had a saxophone player, a bass player, a drummer, and me. So I had to cover all the chord stuff, yep. you know, and and that really kind of kicked my ass and got me going for, you know, how to, you know, learn how to do that stuff and, you know, make it work. Yeah, and fortunately for me, I had his instructions to, you know, I don't know what I would have done without that, you know, but I was able to apply the Frizzell concept and, you know, to that band. And I didn't really do much of that kind of work after that, but I, you know, I did it then. It was. Well, one of the, uh, one of the clips we're going to try to show of you is uh, your performance on uh, David Letterman uh, with you and Marty. 
Yeah. You know, I, I I watched that when it went down that night, and I went, man, this is, talk about some hillbillies coming to New York and literally taking the whole city hostage. This <laughs> from, is a the first thing example that, of that. Yeah, from Studio yeah. 8. Right, Studio 8. <laughs> That's what we're yeah, we were strong. we were setting up our stuff, you know, and, and we, we ran through the, the first – we did one quick run through, you know, and, and Paul's band was all watching us. You know, oh, they, they loved it. They, know, they loved it, man. And, and, and they were like, um, you know, at, at first they were kind of like making fun of us. And then like after the song was over, Paul and, and Sid, the guitar player came over and they're looking at her rigs like, where's your pedals? Where's, what are you doing? Where's all your How do you get that sound? I was like, well, I'm just playing through my, Deluxe, and I got my reverb right here, man. You know, and that's that's it. I don't have any pedals, you know. <laughs> and Marty was, you know, he's like, "What's Marty? Where's Marty's pedals?" I believe he doesn't use any pedals. <laughs> Whoa, you know, it's like wow, nobody dude. plays with no pedals. Yeah. <laughs> nobody does that. Nobody does that. Man, it's such a great. You know, yeah. I, I, usually once a year around Christmas time, that's my Christmas present to a lot of people on uh, uh, Facebook. Is I. I share that video because I just think, man, you guys just nailed it, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, since since that taping, I've, uh, that s- song has evolved into a much more listenable thing. I mean, I, <laughs> my 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 guitar solo is a lot better now than it was then. You know, <laughs> I tell you. But that now there's a song you can't play without a pick. Well, yeah. Right. yeah. And how long did it, you work on? Definitely, that's a, that's a flat pick special right there. It's like playing with Marty kicks your ass because. Man, you know that guy. You know he's a he's a such a good man. Oh, player. Monster. He's wow. maybe my favorite. And, you know, and and then he picks up the guitar and he just like he'll pick up a flat top and wear it out. Wow. You know. Well, he comes from the bluegrass day. You know? you know. And and I'm like, I gotta be on. I can't slack off on that gig if I don't warm up before I hit the stage. He'll hand me my ass yeah. because he's really spontaneous. You know, like he's one of those guys that'll throw you extra solos you know, yeah, out of nowhere, you know, or or he'll play a song that he's always the guy that's played the solo for 10 years and all of a sudden he looks over at you and says, take it. I hate when that it's happens. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, shit, you know, but, you know, he's he's comes from that old school of, you know, when you're on stage, anything can happen sort of mentality. Yeah. And and he's, you know, if somebody makes a mistake, he laughs. He doesn't get mad. Right. No. Unlike you know, some people I know. A, <laughs> if he makes a mistake, he, he laughs. He'll, he'll raise his hand and laugh, you know, he'll, or sometimes he'll stop the song and laugh and say, well, let's try that again. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he, and the audience likes that. You know, when, sure when you is. show vulnerability and the fact that you're just regular guys that fuck up like everybody else, you know, they love that. Yeah. To them, that's more entertaining than, than like, I've had people come up to me and say, man, I saw you guys and you know, in in, uh, in Minneapolis, man, you 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 stopped right in the middle of the song and started it over. That was the greatest thing I ever seen. Man. That was fantastic, you know. And I was like, well, the mistake wasn't the greatest thing, but the fact that you know, they like the fact that we don't take it seriously, I guess. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But you know that that's that's what makes that gig so cool is that he's such an easy guy to work for. You know what else makes it cool is that you know you guys are never going to get a nominated for. Uh, CMA award. <laughs> well, no, no, that's that's never really happen. a feather in your cap, I think. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I. Here you I have the best never... country band in Nashville, and they're nowhere to be seen on any of these shows. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, when I came to town, the that was during the great credibility scare. Steve <laughs> yeah. Earl, you know, when. When Lyle oh, Lovett right. and Steve Earle, Roseanne Cat, and um, the O'Kanes, and um, you know, I guess the last person really was was Dwight, you know. But I had already sort of looked at it like this is kind of the end of that, you know. I I I really didn't see that it was going to last, and I was right, of course. But um, we all saw. I never. Thought, you know, there's hope. You know, when all that was going on. Yeah, there was, there was, and I was really excited. Carlene you know, Carter. But, yeah, I, I'd seen Steve Earle play, like, before I moved to town, and I loved it, you know. I was like, man, this guy, this is more like watching the Rolling Stones than it is a country band. Uh-huh. But I, I liked what, you know, I liked the songs those people were putting out, and the records were good, and 
and I like the fact that it, they all sounded different from each other, you know, and everybody had sort of had an individual thing. Lyle Love, it was cool, you know, and, and uh, it, you know, and I didn't, when I came here, I didn't really have, I didn't think I was going to stay. I had no idea I was going to still be here, you know, like 33 years later, still yeah. sitting in that. Activity. Uh, that was not my plan. And I, and I had no aspirations to be a country person, you know, mm -hmm. I, but, you know, I kept getting gigs in the country music field, like Patty Loveless, who I loved playing with her. Yeah, know? I did too. I actually, I took your place. Well, there was a, there, you were a little bit later, weren't, I think there was a couple of guys right after me, me the, uh, Darren Favorite was there. Oh, he was? I didn't know that. Yeah, and uh, some other dude was there too. I can't remember his name, but. Um, yeah, I loved playing with Patty. The songs were so. Yeah, yeah. man, the first time I, I played with her, we it was a SIR, and when she started singing, I was like, oh, man. I know. She's just, <laughs> yeah. she's the best. It's like, oh, wow. She's the real you know. deal, man. She's the last of the real female country singer. singers. Yeah. All right, Kenny. So do we have any other questions for Kenny? Or... I don't know. You got anything you want to talk about? Yeah, anything you want to. Man, I can talk about me all day long. Folks. <laughs> do you have a website or do you have anything where people can buy your product? Um. No, I don't right now. I don't have anything like that. I do have a couple of live streams coming up. I'm going to do one on Friday night here from the house, just me. And then um, my pal Jeffrey Clemens and I are going to do one uh, on Monday night. Yeah, right. Is this on uh, Jeffrey's Facebook? The, yeah, Facebook Live. Yeah. The, Jeffrey's the guy that uh, I've been playing with for about, we've had a band for almost 10 years now, um, a little wheezy little low white blues band mm -hmm. is that called, what the uh, day bro yeah he's in it some yeah he was he's our latest bass player he's been there for six years i think uh it's called the imperial blues hour and uh jeffrey's a guy from boston he plays drums for uh g love and, oh i um, love g love man and, and jeffrey's a really good blues singer he's got a really good smoky voice and he doesn't sound like a sports bar bowling shirt blues guy right. you know right. he sounds like like those old records when he sings and, and he plays really quiet he's the quietest drummer i've ever played with in my entire and life and when are these going to be on Friday. uh that that one that one is uh monday night at uh seven central and then uh, i think the uh Thing for here from home is going to be uh, Friday night at eight. Okay, and those are they can get uh, people can go go where on Facebook? What what do they do? Just go to Kenny Vaughn on Facebook. Okay, okay, all right. Kenny Vaughn V A U G H A N, and uh, I'll be putting up ads to publicize okay. them. Okay, I'll share. We'll share them on Guitar Talk. Jen yeah, wants the Guitar yeah, yeah. Talk, so we can share that. We want to uh, promote everybody as much as we possibly can. Yeah, you'll see it on my Facebook. Okay, cool. All right, Kenny, I got to go smoke a cigarette, man. All right. All right. See you guys. Take care.